Welcome to Plenary Session. This is the first ever time that our guest is behind the desk. This is Dr. Timothy Olivier. He is a practicing medical oncologist from Geneva, Switzerland. Timothy, thanks for doing this. Hi, Vina. It's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you. In person, live edition. On this side of the desk. Absolutely. You're the only person ever to come across my desk here on Plenary Session. And we're going to be talking about this book, Malignant. Malignant, yeah. This is going to be a series of discussions and interviews about Malignant. We are planning on doing nine of them. We're going to talk about two chapters each time. If you are interested, you could pick up a copy of the book or the audio book, which I painstakingly narrated on this old microphone uh, with the use of many throat lozenges and drinking lots of water, which in an original uncut version was accidentally released as the audio book. There, to some objections. There, there, there were some <laughs> commentaries on uh, Amazon, I think. Yeah, they were unhappy. They didn't like to hear me greedily quenching my thirst. I think it was really interesting to see how painful it can be to make an audiobook. Oh, it's quite painful. Yes, even if you've written the words, sometimes you trip over what you wanted to say, which is shocking. But here we are. Let's talk about it. Malignant, how bad policy and bad evidence harm people with cancer. It's now almost two years old. Wow, it came out in 2020. I was going to write malignant or I was going to write pandemic. I think I chose wrong. Um, no, I, I, I obviously, uh, we didn't plan on the release date. But um, it's a book about cancer drug policy. And um, I don't know. Let's get started. What do you got? Yeah, I have a, maybe a personal question. Yeah, because I know listeners are really interested in that. Mm. So this book obviously is a kind of continuous of uh, many of your works. <clears throat> but is there anything special that really drew you, that really motivates you to start writing this book? Is there yeah. a, a, some event, some patient, some, some friends? Some fa- is there something special or it was really natural? Yeah, so I guess over the course of this, people will see that the, work, that the book is really the culmination of you know, many, many papers and projects that we had done, pulling it all together and trying to tell a single cohesive story. But the exact thing that pushed me to write this book was I had written one book, Ending Medical Reversal, and I thought to myself, never again. That was such a thankless task. Never again will I spend my time writing book. Um, But then I got active on Twitter, and I was working on all these papers. And as the papers kept out, came out, you know, I would comment about them. I would say, well, you know, PFS is not a measure of what's clinically important. And um, genome-directed cancer therapy, it works great when it works, but it doesn't help most people. And these kinds of things are all kind of separate points I was making. And I would get a lot of pushback. People would say, um, yeah, but, yeah, but, you know, it works here, it works there. Yeah, but PFS is still meaningful to people. And I was like, well, you, you, don't, you don't see the whole picture. You just see a little portion here. This is all tying together. It's all telling a cohesive story. And then it was my friend and colleague, uh, Sean Mylan Cody, who's a faculty member at Sloan Kettering, who said, look, you, you get a lot of heat for your opinions, but what people don't really see is they don't see the breadth of your thinking. So you need to sit down and write you know, in a single place where people can see your thinking across all cancer drug policy. It will make it make more sense to others. And that was the proximal event that led me to write it. I thought to myself, yeah, he's probably right. So let me just try to put it all together in one space, sort of a textbook for cancer drug policy. Okay, thank you very much. I will ask for next episode some personal question about mm. how you write, uh, things mm. like that. But okay. I just want to tease a bit, you know, for, for, for the listeners. <coughs> so maybe in the introduction, you start by saying that it's not a cancer biology book. Mm-hmm. And I'm a bit surprised. How can you say you will help people with cancer, help, help to improve outcomes without talking about biology? I think this is a, a core thing in your book, a core principle, but... Can you expand on that? Yeah, I guess I would say that um, it is certainly not a cancer biology book. You know, you're not going to read this book and walk away with a better understanding of the PI3K kinase pathway or something like that. You're not going to have a better understanding of uh, the intricacies of intracellular behavior. Um, but I think we forget that everything begins and ends with a patient. And, you know, there are lots of things to this day that we administer daily such as inhaled uh, gases for anesthesia, that we, I don't think we fully understand the mechanism of action. So, but we do know it works. So empiricism is sort of the core philosophy that I believe in in biomedicine. It, all that matters is, you know, does something work? Does it, you know, how does it work? Uh, sorry, does it work? And then how it works might be the mechanism of action and you can test that. And that's sort of the basic science understanding. This isn't a biology book. It's about what works and what doesn't work. I think that's one point I want to make. And then the next point is your point about, well, how do we improve outcomes if it's not a biology book? And I 
have no I'm I'm a hundred percent sure that biological advances can can improve outcomes for people with cancer. Twenty years ago we didn't know about checkpoint inhibitors, now we know and we're improving outcomes for some people. But I think people forget that better clinical trials, clinical trials that tell us better information, better healthcare policy, better finance, better healthcare financing, more affordable drugs, accessible drugs, these can also save lives. And nobody knows which can save more lives, basic science work or doing better healthcare policy. We don't know. People assume that the only way you can save the most lives is by finding the new you know, magic target in the cell. But I'm pretty confident you can improve cancer outcomes tremendously by having better healthcare policy, better cancer drug policy, better pricing policy, better evidence for patients, more relevant evidence. And this is a book about taking advantage of all those things. Biology, to some degree, will, is a little bit outside of our control. It depends on our technology and the cutting edge of science. You know, as much as we want to accelerate science, there's only so much we will see in our lifetimes. You know, it might be a long process. But everything in this book is entirely within our control. And most of the problems are problems that we created through man-made incentives. Everything in this book could be acted upon tomorrow. And we could fix all these problems and have better outcomes in three years, you know, or two years. Um, so that's what this book is about. Yes, thank you very much. Yes, I think the last point <coughs> is really important. Um, the point you make is uh, all, all this can be changed by human decision. Uh, tomorrow, as you said, even today. So I think this is a, a very important um, principle in, in, in the book, and you, you draw <coughs> that uh, mm -hmm. step by step. Um, the first example you take, and I want you to expand on that, is about a very intensive therapy that was used in, breast in patients with breast cancer. Can you <coughs> talk about this therapy and the story of this therapy? And after that, I will ask you some few questions that are not in the book, but I want to, to have your point of view on that. Okay. So I think, yeah, the introductory story is the story of autologous stem cell transplant for solid tumor, specifically breast cancer. And the reason this is, is the, this is the introductory story is because it, it raises many of the themes that the whole book explores in depth. And what was the story? The story was simple. You know, we came out of the 60s and 70s with a number of cytotoxic chemotherapy drugs that did work. No doubt about it. They did work. They were able to shrink tumors. And for some cancers, we had achieved what we had never dreamt possible, I think, which was cure. I mean, we could cure people with Hodgkin's lymphoma. We could uh, increase the fractional cure rate after surgery in the adjuvant setting. Um, we could cure testicle cancer. That was um, an amazing advance. So combination cytotoxic chemotherapy and maybe some dose escalation was able to greatly improve outcomes for certain cancers. But there were other cancers that had not yet yielded to that. And breast cancer was one, metastatic breast cancer. To this day, I would say, and I, I hope that there's no one who would disagree with me, it's still incurable. I don't know how, how, how much the hype we have these days, but it's still an incurable disease. But the hope was that we could change that, that the barrier to curing breast cancer wasn't that we didn't have the right drugs, we didn't have the right targets, it was that we weren't giving the right dose. And of course, the mantra of if a little is good, a lot is better. That's an American mantra. It's also an oncologist mantra. Uh, a little toxicity is okay. A lot of toxicity means you must be getting better outcomes. That's also sort of an oncologist mantra. Um, and they decided to administer high-dose chemotherapy. I mean, doses of chemotherapy that were it not for stem cell salvage would be lethal. Um, but this would kill the cancer, more cancer. Uh, but the price would be hematopoietic failure. And the only way to rescue someone from hematopoietic failure is to do a stem cell transplant, is to administer uh, the CD34 cells later to salvage them. And this is the idea of transplant. So to put it in lay speak, basically, we connect you to a machine and we collect with some drugs that we give you to kind of boost them in the bloodstream. We collect the stem cells that are in the bone marrow and we, we, we save them. We freeze them with some DMS cell. We freeze them on it. We, we save them for you for later. Then we bring you back a few weeks later and we administer a very high dose of chemotherapy. The dose is so high, it's supposed to kill all the breast cancer, but it will also have the secondary side effect on parts of the body that divide very, that have high fraction of cells undergoing division, let me put it the, the correct way, uh, such as hair follicles and your hematopoietic system, your, your, the, the, the cells in the bones that make new blood. Um, it will kill that off and, if you, and, and, and it would otherwise kill you but I ask you yeah, a very yeah. good question. What would happen if you do that kind of therapy without the transplant? Oh, then the person would perish. Yeah. So it's a lethal dose of chemotherapy. Um, it's killed you because it's killed your bone marrow. But we've saved your cells. So we can administer these cells after we've given that dose. Hopefully we've killed all the cancer. And then the cells will repopulate in your bone marrow. Uh, stem cells are smart. They know where to go. Uh, and then you will survive and you will be restored. 
And when people started doing this, they do what is so common in cancer, single institution, single arm, uncontrolled studies, which is the uh, most, you know, it's still to this day across all biomedicine is so common. And you do that and lo and behold, you have incredible outcomes. There's a fraction of people in whom, wow, it doesn't, it looks like they're doing super well. You know, of course there were some treatment related deaths, but it was well controlled because these patients were carefully selected. And there's a fraction of people doing really well, maybe a couple years down the road. And so it's easy and seductive to believe they're doing better than had they done, had you given them usual treatment. It's even seductive to believe that you're really curing some people. I think some people believe that. And then the money comes into play. We are gonna give people a lot of money for doing this. We're gonna reimburse it heavily. We're gonna make it worth your while to pursue this. And so you get what is so common in medicine, which is you get people enthusiastically proponents of this. Uh, not you know saying things like we hear to this day. It's unethical to te to test it. We know it's a life saving. It's a parachute, Timothy. It's a parachute. You know those kinds of language rhetoric gets tossed out. Go on. You want to say something? No, no, no. Go on. Go on. Go on. So what happens? So <clears> the, <throat> this strategy was imp implement implemented uh, actually in the real life. So what happened oh, yeah. in the in the years after? Yeah, so I mean, I think one of the things to say is that it wasn't just on protocol, it was off protocol, it was widely disseminated. They say estimates put it at 40,000 American women had this done. And it wasn't just women with terminal cancer, with metastatic uh, disseminated breast cancer, it was also women with early stage disease in the hopes you could increase curative fractions there. And there was a lot of money involved. And some of the actors I talk about in the book were really sort of commercial forces that pushed it. Finally, there was some randomized data. Uh, one of those randomized trials, of course, is a very famous story in oncology where there was elements of fraud. And I wonder if you want to talk about that South Africa study. No, no, I think that's, that's re very important. I think it was a first in 95. Yep, 95, and yeah. And we knew years after that there was a fraud. Yeah. But there, there were other trials. I think that the point is interesting because the tri trials, even if some um, people were advo advocating against the ethical issue, against doing these trials, they were done finally. Yes, and um, I've talked to a lot of people behind this, but I think there's a f two good points. One is we did randomize trials eventually, painfully, you know, against all odds. Um, there were some heroes involved with that. I mean, some of the heroes that you wouldn't have expected. I think there was a woman, Naomi Aronson from Blue Cross Blue Shield, who was sort of pushed for that, and then some others who pushed for these studies, um, forces in the cooperative group systems, et cetera, who pushed for these studies because they realized that you need to know for sure before we keep doing this to know if it's helping women. Ultimately, I think... There, I mean, I, I've seen at least six different randomized control trials of this in a, in a pooled meta-analytic estimate by uh, Scott Berry and colleagues. Um, and and, and the, the takeaway conclusion is that, you know, there might be a very tiny difference in time to progression or PFS. You know, that time to progression was PFS where death was censored rather than an event. It was the older one. Um, and uh, But there's no difference in OS. There's not a whiff of difference in OS. And... I think there's still some believers who say, you know, oh, I'm pretty sure it helped this one woman here or this one person there. But the problem with that, with that kind of rhetoric is that there's no way a priori you can identify such a person. How do you know in whom to deploy it? And medical practices are only as good as the people in whom we deploy it and what have, happens in aggregate to those people. And this was something that totally failed. I mean, we did it. It was way more toxic. It was immense. I mean, it's hard to understate how much more toxic it is. You want to talk about that? No, uh, maybe you, you can just mention the, the rate of mortality associated with this kind of, this kind of treatment. I mean, it's non-trivial. I, I mean, if you talk to somebody who does it for a living, they always quote you some lowball figure, but it's not unreasonable to think it's something between 2 and 7% or 2 and 10%. What would you say? Yeah, I think it's, uh, it it's depending on a lot of the selection of the patients. But right. Yes, it's roughly in this ball, ballpark, yeah, absolutely. And that's not trivial. And then, and then the next question is, is there a long-term durable OS benefit that you get as a result of enduring this? And it's not just the death, treatment-related death, it's also the toxicity. It's horrendous. I mean, you know, grade three, four, hematopoietic toxicity is in like the high 90 percentage points, of course, because you're given a, you know, near lethal dose of chemotherapy. Um, it's a very toxic procedure. Nobody, nobody's going to get an, allo, uh, sorry, an auto transplant for fun. Um, they're doing it because they think it's improving their survival. That's not true. And so it is a medical reversal, my first book, and it is a famous example of a misstep in oncology. Emotion, enthusiasm, hype, rhetoric, lack of critical thinking, lack of appraisal, and money paved the way. The road to hell was paved with good intentions, you know. Um, I think what, what is very interesting, maybe you didn't notice, maybe you didn't do it intentionally, but the first example you take is a m medical reversal. Mm. It's a kind of continuity with your, <laughs> with your first book. I think it's one point that is, is interesting, worth noting. Um, I hadn't thought about that, I, but it's I true. I have one question about that, mm -hmm. because it's uh, 
recurrent, I think, in your, in your thinking. Why do you think history is so important in your scientific approach, generally speaking? What, what, what brings science? Because um, here it's really a story. It's one or two decades story of the rise and fall of these procedures because it's not, um, it's not done today. But what is the importance of history in your thinking? I mean, he who forgets history is condemned to repeat it. You know, that's the George Santayana quote. But it's so true. I mean, look at where we are today. We have forgotten everything about history. I mean, <laughs> without getting too much off tangent. But, you know, there's not a day that goes by without somebody telling me that something that they know for sure works, that seems implausible, that has very kind of fragmented, incomplete, uh, uh, biased data, but they know for sure it works, and it's a parachute. It's life-saving. It can never be studied in a randomized fashion. It would be unethical, illogical, impractical to do a randomized study. You know, people have said that before. People much smarter than you have said that before. I mean, the people who developed this procedure are smart people. They were well-intentioned people. They were good people. They were optimistic people. They were the great optimists. But what they developed was something that didn't work. And I think, you know, and I want to talk about two things. History is important to know. So you know the arc of what has happened to those who came before us. You know, in fact, what does it mean to be human? It's that we learn not just from trial and error, but we learn from what our ancestors knew. You know, that's a, a sort of a defining characteristic of our species. Um, but that's part of it. But I want to go one step beyond that. The type of history that I'm interested in, in my first book and in this book, it's the history that doesn't get told too often. You know, I, I try to make this point about ending medical reversal, which is that if you were to pick up Harrison's textbook and you read the history of biomedicine, it is written... You know, history is written by the victors. It's written as if, here's where I want this, the reader to end up on what we're doing today. What do I need to tell them to explain how we've gotten to where we've gotten? You know, I mean, all the all the fails, all the yeah, all the failures, missteps, miscalculations. Those are omitted from the book because we don't do that today. You don't need to know all that to practice medicine. And so I'll tell you sort of a reconstructed history that is sort of incomplete and meant to be a logical progression. And it gives you the false idea that everybody who came before, you know, everything in medicine is a winner, winner. We're just making progress all the time. And what we try to do with medical reversal is to provide a more balanced, truthful, honest, representative history, which was, yes, medicine can take advances. Yes, we have great things. But often we take two steps back. Often we make errors. And we make errors for sort of the same sort of classic cognitive reasons. We're optimistic. And that's great, but we don't subject our practices to rigorous, rigorous scrutiny. We get seduced by competing interests, particularly money. And I talk about that in the book, which I'm sure we'll talk about because some of the chapters focus on it. Yeah, on multiplicity and some of the issue yeah. related also. Yeah, yeah. M multiple shots on goal, Texas sharpshooter fallacy, you know, some classic biases that exist. Um, and anyway, back, so to, to answer your core question, the core answer to your question is that um, history and empiricism is everything in this business. It's everything in this business. You know, I think people talk so much about mechanism, mechanism, mechanism. Mechanism is a story you tell yourself at night to make you feel good when you go to sleep. It's not what's actually going on with your patient. What's actually going on with your patient is empiricism. Does it work on average the way you practice? Does it make people better off? And why does it do that? Maybe it's that story, but five years from now, there's a different story, actually. You know, you and I both know, how does doxyrubicin work? Every week I go, I hear a new story. <laughs> Somebody's always telling me a new story. Um, thalidomide. We, 10 years ago, do you think they really understood how thalidomide worked? I read the Nature Papers from Ben Ebert's lab. I think we're still learning more there. Mechanism is something that's great to know because that will empower new discoveries. I have nothing against it. But what matters to patients is, you know, if you did a randomized trial of people like you, do you on average benefit? I think that's a very important point. And history is very important to know that smart people came before you can be seduced by wrong ideas. And we can learn from that. But I do fear, and this last few years, the pandemic has taught us, we haven't learned. I mean, the average, the average person practicing medicine has a very limited grasp of medical history and has not learned the deep lessons, I think. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's um, also related to the medical education we have. I, I feel that this kind of teaching, the history of medicine, the history of uh, approach, how you approach clinical trials in a historical framework is somehow lacking. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I uh, would I say... I think it's a, it's a, you talk about that in any medical reversal, uh, I think, in the last chapters. But um, I think it's also very important that uh, uh, trainees, we have to be trained to think like that. I think it's, it's really important. The basic science of medical education is evidence-based medicine. But we're not taught that well. We're taught that rather poorly. You know, and I think a lot of my career work has been to 
try to do a better job at communicating that. And that's why we make this video. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. So maybe the last part of this uh, introduction, you speak about the audience. So the <laughs> audience is, um, what, what can you say about the audience? That's what it says. I wrote this book with several audiences in mind. The first are general readers. So I think the point here is that there's at least different groups that I, that I want this to appeal to. One, if you're somebody who, you know, you just read the New York Times newspaper health and that's all you know about medicine, I want you to be able to pick up this book and read it and actually understand what I'm talking about. In fact, I worry that in this video already that I am sh using too much technical rhetoric. And in the book, I actually think I do a good job of taking that out and not being too technical. Yeah, I think um, it's okay it's just to, to ask some question outside of the yeah, book. But yeah, you're, yeah. you're right. I think it's very readable by a large audience. Uh, That's I, my first yeah. goal, at least. These videos, I know who watches, and there's going to be some oncology nerds, so I get, I get into the weeds. But my first goal is that if you're somebody who reads the newspaper, you should be able to pick this up and read it. Because I, I, you know, when I was a lay, when I, I mean, I, when I'm a lay person in many topics, and I enjoy reading those kinds of books. That's one audience. This, and the second reason is I actually think that the average doctor is reading medical literature at the level of a lay person too, in the sense that it's easier for them to read and digest those things. So that's why doctors gravitate to lay person doctor books as well. The second audience I think is practicing people in oncology from pharmacists to nurses to social workers to doctors to providers all these people i think i want this book to appeal to them so that they practice better medicine and and have a sense of what's going on behind the scenes you know why is somebody coming to your hotel room at asco and hanging that bag on your doorknob full of pamphlets what are the incentives that led to that that event i hope the book will let you see that then the third audience is policy people so policy people people who spend their time thinking about how Medicaid and Medicare should work and FDA should work and reimburse and those kinds of high-level policy considerations. That's my third audience. And I hope to write a book that, you know, and I think I say something like, you know, as with any book that caters to a large group of readers, I may not always be able to please everyone. You know, at times I think it'll sound too simplistic or repetitive, but for other people it may feel um, too over their head. Um, but I hope that on balance, if you stick with it and get to the end, um, you will see that I'm trying to weave together some things and um and and i hope you learn something maybe the the only one thing i i want to say here um for trainees i think you you will <coughs> have a lot of knowledge in this book some findings but you also develop um, um skills new skills how how to i think it's not just limited to oncology it's how to approach scientific findings how mm -hmm. to approach scientific reports so it's a kind of uh, new skills that you will um you will learn in this book. Um, it's uh, my little thoughts about that. But I mean, I, and, and I hope that, I'm glad you said that because I, that's like one of the, my, my main goals. I want this to be the book that like, you know, before you do your Hemong Fellowship, like you should, that I, I wish people felt like Malignant was the book that best prepared me for that fellowship. Um, it's in good company. You know, there are other books that everyone, you know, the, the books that you have to read before you get a Hemong Fellowship. I want this to be one of them. And I certainly think it, it'll complement the other ones because the other ones don't get into policy and evidence and thinking and decision making as this book does. So thank you very much for this introduction, Vinay. Okay. So um, we should go to the chapter first one. chapter. So the title is uh, <coughs> The Basics of Cancer Drug. And you start with a quotation of Warren Buffett. Price is what you pay value is what you get yeah so maybe you can first you can talk uh, us about um, a really great drug you, you give an example of a, a great drug a transformative drug and can you talk a bit about this drug and and this will be helpful to compare with uh, our other drugs in oncology yeah so i i I, I, I do want to I always start with the good the great drug because I think it gives you perspective and the great drug was imatinib imatinib is Gleevec and Gleevec is a small molecule inhibitor of BCR able and uh, and I don't just say that because Brian used to be my boss and I have talked to Brian a lot about this and other topics um, but it, it is really the greatest drug of the last 30 or 40 years in oncology why is it the greatest drug um, it's not the greatest drug because it treats everybody with cancer in fact it works in just very very few cancer types cancer types that are addicted to bcr able or C-KIT or, you know, PDGFR, those kinds of things. Um, very few, th few diseases are affected by, are, are, are treated by imatinib, but for CML, it works really well. And to give you some sense of how well it works, you know, I always cite the Swedish data. 
And the Swedish data was CML is a blood-based cancer. It's a cancer that arises in, in, in the bloodstream. And in the 1970s, mid-1970s, if somebody was given a CML diagnosis, and I'm talking about a middle-aged person, somebody in their 50s, their median survival was something like three to four years. So you got a 50-year-old person in your office. They just got heard they had CML. They're going to live three to four years on average. And they're going to lose maybe 25 life years. They would have lived 25 life years had it not been for that CML diagnosis. That's the life expectancy of such a person at the time. That to me is a, is a tough diagnosis. I mean, I think that's tragic. And you're losing so many years of life of somebody who's sort of in the prime of life. Um, fast forward to 2010, um, and you think of the same person coming into the office from the same Swedish data set. We now know that had they not had CML, they might live 27 more years because actually life expectancy goes up as you get older. It's not uh, life expectancy at 18 or at birth is actually even a little bit higher if you make it to a certain age, like 55. Anyway, that's a technical point. They might have 27 years ahead of them were it not for CML. But with CML and with imatinib, they got 25. You know, that years of life loss, that gap, it's almost totally closed. So in other words, yeah. Life ex expectancy nowadays, life expectancy of patients with CML is almost the same as patients without CML. That's right. It's almost the same. Almost the drug the same. almost restores normal life expectancy. And, and it was not at all the case 30 years ago. And this was almost entirely driven by imatinib. That's all correct, yes. And then I would say that the correlator to that is when people talk about a cure, what does a cure mean? And to me, imatinib is not quite a cure, but it might be a functional cure because a cure is something you take for a fixed course of the time that when you're done with, you have the same survival as an age sex match control as somebody who didn't have that diagnosis. Imatinib here, although there are some trials to discontinue, it's largely most people do not discontinue yet. Um, but if you take it, you almost restore normal life expectancy. To me, that's very important. That's what we. That's the goal of cancer. How we forgot the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. I think what's it's very interesting in the story of imatinib. Maybe it's a bit outside of the book. This is the best treatment so far we have in oncology in terms of uh, single drug. In terms of single drug, sure. Um, and it was the first one. Uh, the first tyr tyrosine kinase inhibitor. Yeah. Uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. So. Is it just by, ch I mean, this is, uh, w we don't know why, but it's, uh, it's a bit surprising that it was the first, but still I don't think we have uh, any same drug uh, nowadays. I, I do think to some degree it was luck. I mean, you know, obviously the people who developed it deserve a lot of credit for doing it. It was important work, but they also got lucky in the sense that they picked the best target. I mean, there are some reasons why that makes sense. It is a target that is so obligate had such an obligate necessity to the disease phenotype. I and mean, we're talking about 99% of the phenotype, CML, has the BCR able fusion protein. It's also a cancer that George Sledge has called a dumb cancer because it done got a lot of other mutations. You know, it's got one real important mutation, driver mutation, oncogene, tyrosine kinase event, not a whole lot of others. Um, I don't know how, I mean, uh, uh, I think it's possible that, that, that the people who did this work you know, saw those things as opportunities, but they couldn't have, I think, um, fully known uh, that that was the best target. They did, to some degree, get, I think, serendipitous, lucky. Yeah, that's a um, very really fascinating yeah. uh, story. And I guess I just want to say one more thing on this point, because I think the luck goes both ways. Okay, here's why it goes both ways. One, you got lucky and you had a great breakthrough, and that's terrific. Um, but as a result of such a big breakthrough, there were headlines on the New York Times, which is like uh, the cure to cancer is just a pill away or something like that. And um, everyone launched a thousand ships of every other tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And uh, it was the next decade, I would say. I mean, I don't know if people will argue with me, but it was largely disappointing. I mean, I think people felt an enthusiasm in 01 and 02. I've watched some videos of Varmus uh, uh, and others on, um, on uh, Charlie Rose back in the day. And they, they, you could feel a, a palpable optimism, and they launched all these studies of every TKI under the sun. Um, and then, you know, there were some important, important drugs, EGFR inhibitors, important drugs. Um, but there was a lot of disappointment. And so had it happened in a different order, had the first drug been BRAF and melanoma, had the first drug been EGFR or ALK, I don't know if we would have had the same research agenda. 
we might have had a more diverse research agenda and not thrown everything in the TKI bandwagon. So to some degree, it was a great success. It led to all these great drugs. To another degree, it kind of was a fo- w- sort of... It, fo- set, it, set, it set the standard very high. It set the standard high, and it led to sort of an... Uh, um, we put a lot of R&D into TKI development, maybe more than we ought to have, because one of the themes of this book is that science, basic science funding should be always diversified portfolio, mm. always mm. diversified mm. portfolio. Mm. Um, Similarly, it would be like if you bought one cryptocurrency and you had a good outcome, you're going to buy every cryptocurrency. But maybe you should diversify your portfolio and not just buy cryptocurrency. doesn't mean it wasn't a good bet. It was good. It still saved people. It saved so many people to this day. It's a great drug. Um, but maybe it gave us a little bit too much optimism for what we can accomplish by drugging single oncogenes. Okay. I think it's a good introduction for the next step. So mm. can you explain us about um, what is the average benefit of our drugs today? Yeah. Maybe you can start with the Tito Fojo analysis uh, yeah. 2014. Yeah, it was a great paper. I was a fellow at the time, and Tito was writing it. He was giving, I think, the John Conley lecture, um, an invited lecture. And Tito had this idea that he said, you know, people just don't have the, they don't have the right idea about cancer drugs. And I believe the year was like 20, 2012, 2013, 2014. And uh, Tito said, let's just take the 71 drugs, the last 71 drugs we approved for solid tumors, and let's just show the PFS difference and the OS difference. Just 71 consecutive drugs, just the last 71 off the assembly line. What's the PFS de- benefit? What's the OS benefit? And if they're missing that data, put a missing column. PFS benefit was something like 2.5 months. OS benefit was 2.1 months. So Tito's point is that, yes, we've got some great drugs like imatinib and rituximab and, you know, trastuzumab. But the average drug has a 2.1-month survival benefit. It's modest. Okay. But there were another study a few years later that showed a 3.4 months benefit by Sebastian Salas Vega. Mm. What, what do you think about that? There, there, was, uh, there were an increase in benefits or it's still not, um, not impressive, but it's 2.1 to 3.4. You talk about this in the book. I can tell you're an oncologist if you th- you're thinking the difference at 2.1 and 3.4. Yeah, I talk about this. Uh, yeah, this, uh, the Salas Vegas paper, um, GM Oncology paper, and I think I actually wrote a letter in response. Um, you know, and I think one point I want to make right off the bat, and I, I probably should have written this many, many years ago, which is that, um, you know, if it's two months or three months, I think we can all agree it's still not good enough for our patients. Just not good enough. I mean, you're talking about you got a 40-year-old, a 50-year-old in your clinic who's dying of cancer, and you're going to give them two months versus three months. I mean, it's just not good enough. You know, it's just not good enough. And I think we, we, we forget that all the time in oncology. We have to do better. Um, but I do think that the Salas Vega paper has some problems. Um, I think I listed multiple problems. The one that comes up to the top of my head is that they include modeled estimates. Um, you know, in medicine and in life and in science, there are things you measure and there are things you model. And actually, this is a good year to make this point because when I made this point many years ago, people didn't appreciate it. But did you know, models are not always right. (laughs) And in the wake of the last two years, I think everyone knows. I see where you go. Models are, you know, often erroneous. They're often wrong. They're, they're, um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Um, You know, that's kind of a mantra, but, but modeling is an imperfect science. And of course, if you believe that things work, you can find a way to model a favorable estimate. And I think this paper used modeled estimates that were developed between companies and health technology assessment programs that generally, I think, optimistically estimated the benefit of a therapy under idealized circumstances, giving favorable assumptions for things like crossover and post-protocol therapy, et cetera. Um, And I think for a number of reasons, the FOHO estimate is probably truer. The FOHO is literally what they're showing. It's literally what's measured. But, you know, I don't, I don't, at this point in time, we don't have to split hairs. If you want to say 2.5 months split the difference, I'm happy to concede that. But then I will also say that's just not good enough. Okay, so let's assume that ballpark. And as you said, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, pretty the same ballpark. So now, now I have a question. So these are the data in trials. Can we expect the same outcome for patients that we will be treating uh, in our clinic, in our daily clinic? Uh, you talk about uh, one specific example. I think it's very, very interesting and very impactful when you realize that. Yeah, and I saw this, um, you know, as I was writing the book, I think I saw this great example. The example was Sharp and Serafinib uh, versus Best Supportive Care in Liver Cancer. And I think if you go back to the 07 paper by Joseph Yove and colleagues in New England Journal, you'll see that uh, people with liver cancer, uh, unresectable, advanced, 
Um, they didn't have a great standard of care, but arguably it was uh, doxorubicin. But in this trial, they assumed they didn't have a good standard of care. Certainly nothing had shown a proven survival benefit. They randomized patients to serafinib, a no novel, dirty, promiscuous, you know, TKI that hits a bunch of targets versus best supportive care. And they found a benefit. And it was a benefit that, you know, led to a seminal paper. A lot of people excited. And what they did was in the control arm, people who had best supportive care, they lived about 7.9 eight months, eight, 7.9 months. And in the intervention arm, they lived about 11 months. It was, I think, a 2.7 month survival benefit yeah. in this study. And, um, you know, that was a step forward, a baby step. Um, but they took people mostly with child's PUA. They took people who were um, young, healthy, the kinds of people enrolled in clinical trials, the kinds of people who would otherwise be fit enough, socioeconomically well-off, well-connected enrolled in clinical trials. And people wondered what happened to that drug when you extrapolated it to the real world. And I started prescribing this early in my career, as even as a fellow, and I would have people come back and say, this drug is hard to take, doctor. It makes my hands and feet ache. It causes all these side effects. I feel fatigued. I don't like this drug. I don't want to take it. You know, they throw the pill. They say, get out of here, this stupid serafinib. Um, finally, Stacey Dusitzina and colleagues published a paper in The Oncologist, I believe, if memory serves me, and it looked at Medicare data set. And um, it compared real-life Medicare beneficiaries who got serafinib to propensity score-matched beneficiaries who are otherwise comparable but didn't get serafinib. But you don't even need to look at that comparison to make the point. Just look at the, the outcomes of real-world people getting serafinib in the real world, average people on Medicare. And the median survival was four and a half months or something. It was about half of what it was taking placebo on the pivotal trial. People in... People in the real world taking a real drug live half as long as people taking placebo in the trial. Astonishing. And that speaks to how unrepresentative the trials are. And even if you were to assume that serafinib still has a benefit, what is the benefit? Are we talking 1.4 months, 1.6 months? It was 2.7, but now we know, we know the upper bound, you know. I think that was a, a very impressive example. Um, you give another example in, in the book about um, they try to estimate how many patients with lung <laughs> cancer would be eligible for, um, it's, it was a Kaiser Permanente uh, example. So maybe you can just give the example. So in, it was a two, um, they tried two, to, to two see, two, two, yeah, two trials, two trials the and they found that only 21% of them could have been eligible for the trials. So yeah, this was a great researcher. Yeah, His name, yeah. uh, Lou Fehrenbacher. I think some people in cancer will know him. He was a many time seasoned Kaiser doc and a great researcher within Kaiser. It's actually the example of how you can go to Kaiser, have a great research career. Lou worked at Kaiser Vallejo, actually not too far from us, maybe about 20 miles away. And he had a very interesting idea. Let's just take two contemporary randomized controlled trials that were really well published. And let's just take the inclusion exclusion criteria and let's just take the last, I don't know, 400, 500 people in Kaiser that we just saw with lung cancer with the, you know, the same stage. And let's just see how many could have enrolled in this trial. Let's just run through the criteria. And he's like, oh, well, this person can't, this person can't, excluded, excluded, excluded. And he left with the answer 20%. So what he's saying is that Kaiser, which is a broadly nationally representative sample, only 20% of those people can be on this study because you have so many rules to get on your study. And I think that gives you another clue. The studies are just not representative of average cancer patients. And are we going to talk at some point about how, I mean, some people interpret this to mean that uncontrolled observational studies are the best because they look at real people. That's not how I interpret it to mean. I interpret it to mean that why don't you just run a randomized trial without all those stupid exclusion criteria? Run a pragmatic randomized control trial. Drop those exclusion criteria and get the benefit of randomization, which balances you know known and unknown confounders and equil equilibrates outcome distributions. But... Do it in everyone. People look like your patient. That's the solution anyway. I think I come to that at some point in the book. Yeah. Yeah, you will come to that. So basically you explain you give the you gave the example of imaginib that was really transformative. You talk also before about checkpoint inhibitors. Mm -hmm. But mainly the the situation is not so optimistic <laughs> on average. Um yeah. so now we come to the cost of drugs. So can you just briefly explain us what, what was the evolution of cancer drugs over, over, over time? Yeah, so I think, um, well, now we're talking, the book is almost out of date, you know, because the book is uh, giving drug pricing based on 20, 2017, 20, 18 levels. Yeah. I think I wrote the book in 
I think I wrote the book in the second half of 2018, or I forget exactly when. I think in those years, um, the prices have gone even higher. I mean, to give you some perspective, in the 1960s, one month of an anti-cancer drug was about 100 bucks, 100, 200 bucks per month of therapy. By the late 1990s, you know, we're talking about 1,000 bucks per month of therapy. And that was the age of Taxol, the first cancer blockbuster, the first cancer drug that had annual earnings in excess of a billion. And they did that because they just cranked up the price, you know? Um, people had thought the only way to get a blockbuster drug was to be in heartburn and uh, diabetes, a very common disease. They didn't think you could do it in cancer, but they were able to. Um, by the time I wrote the book, I think we're talking about a median price of a novel anti-cancer drug of over 10 grand, 12 grand, 15 grand. But I think now we're getting to the price point, we're talking about 20 grand for one month supply of a new anti-cancer drug. That's a lot of money. And it's not, it's, it's gone up much higher than other classes of healthcare spending other classes of spending across the board. It's gone up much higher than real earnings and real wages. Um, we're, we're suffocating with these prices. These prices are horrific. I think we, we can talk about the, the next concept you introduce here. It's about value. And you talk about quality. Can you explain mm -hmm. briefly what is the concept about quality mm -hmm. and why value is important, how you can um, put that in the context of any society and trade-offs? You yeah. speak about that in, in that in that chapter. Trade-offs, that's a um, taboo word these days. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. And I yeah, think it's yeah. important to to just uh, raise this topic because sometimes it's a, it's a tough uh, tough topic, so I think it's important. So can you explain us about value, uh, what is a quality, um, what are the data about our ca cancer drugs? I mean, yeah, price is what you pay, value is what you get. Value is some relationship between the good things the drug gives you and the bad things. So it's something to do with the benefit the drug provides mitigated by its cost and toxicity. What is that ratio? And there's one metric that economists like to use, which is a dollar per quality or the additional amount of money you have to pay for one, qual one good quality, quality adjusted life year. What does that mean? That means a year in good health is one quality, a year with some infirmity, some malady, some disability, that's slightly discounted. It's not quite a year in good health. I think able-bodied people do dis, they, they, we able-bodied people are often um, too pessimistic about the quality of life for a year of living with a disability. Um, it's often much higher than you think it would be, but it's still, you know, not one. Um, and how much money should a society spend to give one, one such year back? And the reason it matters is that there are lots of things we can spend on. You know, we have only have so much money and there's so many good causes. I could put more money in, in this city, San Francisco, in childhood nutrition, in prenatal testing, prenatal counseling, prenatal nutrition, early childhood development, education, better meals in school cafeterias. I could put money into paving the roads, backup cameras on cars, safety mechanisms and doors. You know, I could put money into childhood vaccination campaigns or COVID vaccination campaigns. I think this is part of the considerations that the, the UK is going into. How much do they weigh these different campaigns? I could put money into cancer drugs and Impella balloon pumps and all these things. And I have to decide, how should I do that as a society? And the answer is a rational society. I don't know if we're that rational in the US, but some countries are. Your country is Switzerland. And I think the UK is more rational. A rational society will say is like, look, we want to do things for everybody, but all things being equal, we got to put more money into things where we get better return, where we benefit more people or people to a greater degree, where we have more qualities as a result. Um, so I think that's the philosophy of a quality, that if you have a dollar per quality assigned to a therapy, you get some sense of the relative value of that therapy, that value it provides both to the person and to society. And if you're talking about societal spending, which is what healthcare often means in many countries, then I think it really does matter and that we all have an interest in thinking about value. Mm, yeah, I think you, you give an example in the book, even inside healthcare, inside medicine, you have a, um, you can have very different value, value for instance, hypertensive drugs, mm -hmm. uh, oncology. I, I mean, these kind of trade-offs you can have in e even inside medicine. So. Yeah, of course. And even between, is it better to deliver, you know, another 20 doses of full Fox or to add a Vastin to, you know, some people, or is it better to put money into a blood pressure program in the primary care clinic or to put money in to our, um, you know, eighth or 12th line, you know, myeloma therapy. But what would, what would you say to somebody that would, would, would argue that <clears throat> how, can you, how can you limit some benefit to a price? Yeah. Um, I think this is why it is a, a tough question. And 
you gave a lot of example already, but what w I was thinking maybe if you give an extreme example, this can be helpful. If you say to somebody, you yeah. will have to spend, the society will have to spend maybe $2 million dollars to get you two hours of life more. Maybe it won't, f maybe they will understand even right. for their children, even, even for the society. Maybe this kind of extreme example can be helpful, but I know that sometimes it's it's difficult this, yeah. this topic. I don't know what 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 you what you feel I mean, about that. I mean, I think the point I always meant to make to people is that um, every society is rationing. Every society is making the choice. There's no society that pays for every single thing for every single person in every single way possible. Every society is rationing. We ration in the U.S. You just don't see it. Here's how we ration: people who weren't born in this country who don't have citizenship, they don't get good care at all. They get terrible care. Poor people don't get good care at all. People who are in states that haven't expanded Medicaid eligibility, they get terrible care. We ration based on how you were born, that what God decided when he put you on this earth. We're, that's how we ration. We don't ration based on whether or not we're doing what benefits the most people. The way we ration is cruel. It's capricious. It's discriminatory. It's penalizing. It's cold. I think it's horrific, but we ration. And quality dollar per quality is asking people to ration at least on the thing that is just and fair and balanced. And then the other argument I would make is to say... Um, You know, if there is an intervention we can do for pregnant women who are about to have a baby, and you're saying that you're going to have a thousand babies who have longer lives, they live five years longer, um, and it's the same price as that cancer drug that extends survival by maybe two weeks in an idealized situation, when in the reality it may not even give you the two weeks. How should a society weigh this if it has this choice? That, that you know, a thousand babies and a thousand lives versus right. one person for a few weeks. And I think, you know, as much as I think you this is good yeah. to have a, a, a concrete example of yeah. wh what this trade off uh, are. So thank you very much. So, um, but I guess I want to say one more thing. Yeah. In the years since oh, I've written oh, the yeah. book, my thinking has evolved even more. And to say, I would say that a lot of these things are, you don't even need to evoke the trade off. I mean, so many of our drugs are purely financial products. You know, they're not helping anyone, even one lick. I mean, do I really believe? that, um, that uh, a drug like regorafib in colon cancer has benefited Americans. And I'm not saying that is there one person or here or there who benefit. I'm saying the presence of serafinib on the market, did it lead to aggregate good? Because for every one person who may have had a life extended by a month or something, you know, regorafinib, there were many people who delayed hospice because they got put on regorafinib. They delayed spending time with the family. They delayed that last vacation. They delayed something and they got put on a drug with only toxicity, no benefit. Maybe some people's lives were shortened by regorafenib. I, I don't know how well regorafenib works in the real world. Maybe it has a net survival decrement. I don't know. And so is regorafenib a drug or is it a financial product for the makers? I don't know. Maybe in, in other words, what you are saying is that most of our cancer drugs have a very, very low value. That's very right. Very low, yeah. So the quality is very high. Yes, and, and, and that's measured under ideal circumstances. And when you, when you move from this ideal, ethereal, platonic world to our world, benefits don't get bigger. They go down, and value doesn't get better. It gets worse. And I think in the book, I give you things that cost a million dollars per quality. Or yeah, and, and recently quality. you updated this uh, in, a, in a course you gave, and you, you find a quality that was infinite. Infinite, right. Yes, it's infinite. Yeah. And then we are about to publish that paper. Hopefully they'll accept it. Yeah. Yeah. with the Idean, but it'll basically give uh, more meaning to this. Yeah. I mean, w what we're doing right now, it's un like a, a society, it would be, it, you would think you're crazy for a society to spend so much to improve endpoints that aren't measures of what matters to people at great price, while the same society neglects, neg and it's not, we're neglecting so much, you know? We're neglecting so much in this society. It's crazy. So the next point, I think now, you said of the, the price of the drug, so why this cost is so high so mm -hmm. you were interested in in what is mm -hmm. ju justifying the cost of drugs so maybe the first question is uh, manufacturing the drug yeah. how does it cost to manufacture a drug maybe the price is just justified <coughs> by by a very technical very biological uh, th thing that is very difficult so what what is the um, price of manufacturing a drug I mean, to put it in perspective, at the time the book was written, I believe Gleevec was, you know, just coming off patent. And we're talking about Gleevec, you know, you'd usually drop $90,000 for generic Gleevec for a year or something like that, or $80,000 for generic Gleevec for a year. Um, the cost of making Gleevec was maybe, you know, $100, a few hundred dollars a month. So like the manufacturing cost of a small molecule inhibitor is often trivial in comparison to the list price. 
So that's one thing to say. All the small molecule inhibitor drugs are, uh, it's not explained by the manufacturing price, the price to make the pill. Antibodies, yeah, they cost more. Cellular therapy, yeah, it costs more. Carl June is quoted as saying in the New York Times that to, for me to make that CAR T in my lab, it's 20 grand. But that was Carl June's lab. When it's made through the efficiency of high throughput, I don't think it's 20 grand, but maybe it's 15 grand or 10 grand. That's not zero, that's expensive. But the, mar the list price of that product is $473,000. So most of the price is not explained by manufacturing. And I'll stop there because I'm okay. sure you're gonna ask me about the yeah, other possible so, explanations. So, okay, so you, you give the, the example of an iPhone. So yeah. there's, a, there's a price to manufacture the iPhone, but there's also the price of um, research, research and development, R&D. So there were a study by Tuft that found that for any cancer drug, the price of R&D was $2.6 billion. Mm -hmm. so what do you think about this day? Because it's huge, so they have to, you know, they have to... This is the study by Joe DeMasi and colleagues, and I guess I'm not the first or only person to be, I think, critical of that estimate. I think that's a highball estimate, you know, and that was an estimate that's, you know, maybe now almost a decade old. I mean, it's been a while. So if they reran their analysis, it's gonna be a lot higher, I suspect. But I guess that estimate has a different parts to it. They say it's 1.3 billion to make the drug, and there's 1.3 billion, which is lost earnings on capital. What do I mean? If you're developing a drug, that's money you weren't able to invest in the stock market. That's money you weren't able to save in your savings account. So not only should you pay the price of what it costs to invest in the drug, but also how much money you lost had you invested that in other things. And so they have a lost earnings on capital percentage, I think 10 and a half or 10, Absol yeah, 10 and a half. Yeah, absolutely. It was 10 and a half percent, which is good, to be honest. If, I, if, you could, if you could give me an investment portfolio with a 10 and a half percent return on investment year over year, I take it, because I'm not doing so hot in the market. Um, Warren Buffett said that eight was more realistic. So when we ended up doing our paper, we used a more realistic number. Um, that's one of the problems. The other problem is, I don't know where he gets the 1.3 billion. It's, they enter into uh, non-disclosure agreements with companies for information. It's not transparent. There's no way to audit it. I can't say, you know, there's, the math is wrong here. There's a typo here. I can't say that because I can't see the data. I don't know what the data is. I don't even know what companies it is. And it was a study uh, led by companies. To some degree, I think to some degree. indirectly funded by companies with company NDA. I think the center he works at, yeah. It's so, a it's a it's a company loving study. That's how I describe it. So you work <laughs> on on this same research question, and because you were interested to find if this was accurate, and what did you find? Yeah. So of course, this was the paper I published with Chom, um, and uh, he should get the credit because he had the, the uh, I mean, he often has the core insight. He had the core insight of the paper, which was that um, among all the drugs out there, there's a set of those drugs that were brought to market by a company that was publicly traded that had no other drug products and they got one product on the market. And we've picked those companies and there were I think like 10 such companies. And we had their SEC filings for many years so we could kind of sum their cumulative R&D portfolio across not just the successful drug but all the unsuccessful drugs. So we knew how much money they spent to bring those 10 drugs to market. And we knew how many other drugs that failed and I think they had a 80% failure rate or something like that. Um, despite 80% failure, they brought these drugs to market and we could add up what did they actually spend and i think and, and then give them credit for lost earnings uh, on capital I, I think what is important it was really uh, the same as for other um, other drugs it was really mm -hmm. the same kind of distribution that you would have expect for broader analysis ah right across the pharmaceutical sector i think yeah. so i mean i think there are people who criticize our paper that say it it still isn't accounting for all the failure out there and i think you know i have such mixed feelings about that because like yes um uh, yes, uh, yes and no. I mean, yes, like if people, if you didn't pay for all the failures out there, you wouldn't get R&D innovation. At the same point, uh, if you ensure people that you're gonna make so much money, uh, no matter how much you fail, then you don't have any risk in the system. And if you have no risk in the system, then what are you investing in? It's a, it's a sure bet. It's basically a government come on, it's a government subsidy. Um, but anyway, I, I do think that, you know, to this point, I think it's a roughly representative sample. It's a, it's a realistic estimate. We use 8% lost earnings on capital. And I think we get something like, you know, three quarters of a billion dollars. It's, it's still not zero, 750 mil. Um, but so that's the range of estimates from three quarter of a billion to two and a half billion, something in that ballpark. But I, I, I'm even happy, you know, in the year since the book, Back in those days, I argued tooth and nail about, you know, 800 million versus 2 billion. But I'm willing to concede. Even if you concede the 2 billion, the amount of money they make post-market is so high 
you know, that, that they're, they're crushing it, even with 2 billion outlays. But I do think it's probably closer to a billion at the time. Uh, actually, maybe now it's probably about a billion, a billion dollar outlay to bring a drug to market. So you, you will come back in future chapters, so I won't ask you too many questions on this. The last thing you say... Um, Wait, I want to say one thing. Yeah, anything. okay, okay. With the FDA dropping the bar for approval, though, mm -hmm. it might be cheaper. Because <laughs> they're approving so many things okay, with I lower see, and lower standards see, of evidence, I see, I see. improving success rates. So who knows? Okay, yeah. I see, okay, I see. Yeah, good. Uh, fair point. So the last thing, we, we would expect a drug, uh, if, a, if a drug improves overall survival and not progression-free survival, uh, uh, I mean just not progression free survival, but also <laughs> overall survival or if it improves quality of life, we would expect this drug to be justifiably more expensive. Yes. Was it right? And the second question, we would also expect a drug that um, will improve overall survival by 20 months or by 40 months or by 10 years, um, or even like imatinib, to be more expensive than a drug that will improve your overall survival by some months. Yeah, and so you study both of these questions, and what was your finding? Yeah, so this was a paper we published in JAM Oncology, I think, in the when, in the inaugural year, called Five Years of Cancer." No, it's um, uh, oh, what's the title? It had to do. With I think it was five years. Five years yeah, of yeah, cancer yeah. drug approvals, cost, benefits, something like that. Yeah. Um, but basically, it asked this question: Is there a relationship between? And this was Sham and myself. There's a relationship between the price that they're charging. And these other things you think might go along with price. One thing you might think is that drugs proven to improve survival cost more than drugs that merely improve PFS. And that might cost more than drugs that just lead to deeper responses. We're going to explain what these concepts are in future, in future talks because that comes up in the next chapter. Um, but what we found was no. Drugs that improve survival. It was the contrary. It was the contrary. Drugs that improve survival. Drugs that improve PFS, they're about $100,000 per year of therapy. Drugs that generated a response without proven survival gains was like $160,000 per year of therapy. So that didn't explain it. In fact, it's counterintuitive. The less rigorous the endpoint, the higher the price. Okay, then the next thing we looked at was um, um, the magnitude of benefit. If you improved OS and you improved it a little bit, surely you get some money, but if you improve it a lot, you'll get a lot more money. And we found through regression analysis that actually the amount of PFS gains, the amount of OS gains only explained maybe 10 to 15% of the variability in pricing. It had a very modest contribution next to nothing. So poor R squared and a flat, flat slope on that curve, La very low beta coefficient. I mean, it explained very little. And the last thing we looked at was novelty, which is something we also looked at with um, the cost of drugs paper. And, and what we found was that there is, there is none. Um, and the thing that cl that's biasing me is because we have, uh, we're going to publish some new work in this space, so I know some more things that I'm not sharing. Um, but it is clear that at that time, in 2015, when we did that work, or 2014 when we did it, that novelty, something totally new, an ibrutinib versus, you know, the 25th PD-1 drug, you know, versus the next dirty TKI, that, that didn't explain the pricing. That didn't explain the pricing. The magnitude of benefit didn't explain the pricing. The regulatory hurdles that the, com that the FDA threw up didn't explain the pricing. What explained the pricing? The pricing was always what the market will bear. They're charging more than what the companies charged last month, and they're charging what they think is not so high that Peter Buck and Hagop Kantharjan go on 60 Minutes and call you out. They want to charge just a little bit more, but not so much that you get everyone's attention. And that's what we've been doing for the last 10 years, 20 years. A little bit more, not so much we get too much attention, and we are the frog in the pot and they're heating the water slowly, and we're not jumping out, and we're going to boil. Okay, on that, po <laughs> on, on that, on that positive on that note, like you note. say, um, so th this, uh, this is the end of uh, introduction in chapter one, mm. and I don't want to ask too much que question because we will go into many other topics um, along the, the book, but maybe you have some clothing thoughts um, mm. on this introduction and first chapter? Yeah, I guess, I mean, I... Now that you talked about it, you're jogging my memory, because it's funny how um, you know how the time flies. And and there are many up updated works ongoing. So yeah, on the space. But yeah. I guess what I'd say is that um, you know I remember. I, I guess it, it took me a while to see this stuff. You know, I remember um, I was always interested in health policy when I entered into Hemonc Fellowship in 2012, and. Um, but I think like many people, and I had read all the sort of classics at the time, 
I had just come out. I think the Pulitzer had just been given to to Sid uh, for Emperor, and I just read Emperor, which is sort of really a sort of a hero heroic story of oncology. And I had read some of the other sort of seminal cancer books, um, uh, Commotion in the Blood. That was a great book, you know, and, and some some other really good books. Um, and I think I'd also followed very closely the media coverage of cancer for many years. And I think I thought cancer was this place where we were constantly having breakthroughs and miracles and just making such substantive progress. And then you go to the reality of cancer where you find that, yes, there are really breakthroughs, but there's also, you know, sobering, slow, aching, you know, progress um, and, and, and lack of progress in a lot of spaces. Um, and then you, you, you start to encounter the financial difficulties, you know, hard to pay for something, um, differences between the care being provided at sort of a, uh, a, 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 a sort of a hospital that caters to, to people without terrific health insurance in a place that has like, you know, lofty health insurance, um, differences in what the availability of drugs are. You start to talk to colleagues who work globally, um, the challenges they face um, because of the price of drugs. Um, and then you start to think about value and what is value and where does it come from? And um, I think I knew the auto transplant story from my reversal work, um, and, but I didn't know all the history. And I kind of read more about that history. And the more I read about the history, I did see, sort of started to see these themes. So I think, you know, that was kind of how I began in oncology, starting to think about the basics. Um, you know, how, how do we know it benefits our patients? What about my patient that doesn't look like my trial patient? What about my patient who has got this copay that's crushing them? What about my patient? Uh, what about the price of the drug that's just so, so high? Um, and those were the first kind of warning signs that kind of got my, piqued my interest in cancer drug policy. Um, and then I think, um, so that was a natural place to begin the book. And that's kind of level setting for the audience because by the end of it, we'll get into some technical topics, I think. And also solutions. Solutions, I think. Solutions that, you know, to me, the solutions is what, I mean, I hate to say it, but like, the book is aiming for the solutions. It always was. You know, when I was on Twitter and arguing about these issues, I knew what the solutions were, you know, but nobody would have agreed with me on the solutions. And actually, it's been interesting to be in argue, arguing on these topics for now, you know, seven years. Why is that interesting? Because there are definitely things that I was arguing that now are universally accepted as the right answer. Um, but you don't get any credit for it. <laughs> I, see, I see. I see. I see that. Yeah. And um, uh, but but seven years ago, they were hot issues and people pushed back hard. Um, and I think cost was one. You know, I think a lot of people, at least they they told themselves stories why that cost was justified. Um, but, you know, I see you've read closely. You've got good questions, Timothy Olivier. You'd, and to be fair, we didn't practice any of this. Yeah, these, I'm blind. No, no, I've never yeah, seen it's, these. It's blind. Um, I was a very early reader of Malignant. I was already following Penny Recession at the time. Mm. And um, for me, it was really an important book. And I, I really, you know, I do really think that every trainee, at least in oncology, should read this book. You can agree, disagree. I mean, no, no matter, but... It's always good to to be you know to to have a, an original content. I think. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So um, and I guess the thing is, some, yeah. some people say that like, oh, uh, the the book is like the podcast, but it's the other way around. I think I had drafted the book fully before I even started the podcast, and so the podcast is how you talk about these issues, having written the book, but no one had read the book, so it was kind of trying to ease people in that water. Um, but yeah. So thank you very much. Um, I hope listeners will like. If they want to ask specific questions for next ex episode, they can write emails. To who? To you? To me. Or to What's your email address? Um, they can find on papers. And, uh, okay, uh, that's the best way. Yeah. Um, Thanks for doing it. Closing thoughts? No. No. On, this po on that positive note, until thank next time, thank you very Dr. Much. Olivier, we'll be back. Only eight more sessions. Yeah. <laughs> that seems a lot. Okay. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care.